I'll be honest, the day I got that letter that I was gonna have to accompany you from Silvermore to the video, I wanted to jump into the nearest river and have the stream carry me away. Nothing personal, but I'm a sellsword, and people like you, the offspring of some count, don't tend to like me very much unless we're useful to you. But the pay was good, and the travel would take about a month, and in Zavidia, there are a few good taverns that I've been meaning to go back to. So I set my pride aside, took the job, and went to meet you. I'll be honest, a little underwhelmed when I first saw you. Don't take it the wrong way, but people have a way of building things up in their own head. And I had done just that. And then there you were. Packed with entirely too much shit for this journey. Looking me up and down and telling me I needed a bath. Before you said as much as hello to me, by the way. Which, yes, I will never let you forget because that was rude as hell. Don't they teach you, like, etiquette or some shit in whatever fancy school your father shipped you off to? But whatever. I did end up introducing myself. You finally said hello and introduced yourself. And you were not very happy to hear that you would have to leave some of your stuff behind. I believe it took you about another hour and a half to resort what things you wanted to take, what outfits, what shoes, what books, what other trinkets, knickknacks, and hobbies you wanted to take with you on your visit to... What was it again? Your uncle, right, right. Well, eventually, and with a lot of apologizing from your father, by the way, you were ready. We saddled our horses, and off we went. I'll be honest, my first impression of you as a travel companion was a poor one. You complained about everything. It's too warm, the road's too rough, I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, my butt hurts. Honestly, the fact that I didn't immediately turn around and deliver you back to your father is a small miracle. But again, the pay was good. Our first stop was in some little hovel without a name. You were not happy about the accommodations, but then again, you're a spoiled little brat, aren't you? Luckily, the tavern had the mercy of having two available rooms, so I wouldn't have to share it with you. I did wonder why someone like your father would hire a rabble like me to deliver his offspring from one place to another. I would assume he could afford his own private guard, no? But eventually, and I didn't even have to pry, by the by, you ended up relinquishing a little bit of information. Your family had fallen on hard times, and you were going to your uncle to settle some trade dispute that somehow you had the key to. I didn't pry, because to be quite honest, I didn't care very much, but... Apparently, whatever you were set to do in Zavidia would mean that your family would no longer be on hard times. And I took your word for it. The first week of travel, would I would describe that as my own personal version of hell. The complaining, you nonstop talking, and the shitty accommodations that I am used to, but you are not, so that it was even more complaining... It was exhausting, but you started to grow on me, as much as I loathe to say it, you grew on me. I think the first time that I genuinely started to like you, even marginally, like a little bit, don't flatter yourself, was when you told a story about your childhood, about growing up in Silvermore. 
You told me the story about the first time you went to the night market, which you had never been allowed to do. But your father decided to take you because learning these things and connecting with your people is important to imitate your imitation of your father. You told me how you were mesmerized by everything, by the people, by the goods, by the lights. And eventually you strayed from your father. And when he found you again, you were dancing on a table in a rather seedy tavern. You apparently had a way of charming people. And honestly, I was starting to feel the effects of that. Because you were starting to charm me. Don't get a big head about it. We were about two weeks into traveling when I really could say that I could stand you at this point. The complaining had lessened to a degree where it was tolerable, and you ended up relinquishing more stories about your family, about growing up, about escapades you went on, about previous travels you've had, people you met, people you knew, some gossip about people I've never even heard of. But your talking filled the quiet. And I could appreciate that. Then one night, we found ourselves in a little village called Hunter's Hill. There was a tavern, but only one vacant room. I did the polite thing and offered to sleep on the floor, but you wouldn't hear it. You said that we would sleep in the same bed. We could sleep on either sides, backs turned to no funny business. I didn't want to. But you were being awfully persuasive. So, against my better judgment, I agreed. I laid awake for a long time that night. Just kind of listening to you breathe as you slept. And I thought about everything. You were still a brat. You still complained far too much, but I was starting to like you. You were funny, witty, sometimes. You were surprisingly good at bartering, and you're nice to look at. Again, don't get a big head about this. Eventually, I turned myself around, and I noticed that in your sleep, you'd done the same. You were softly snoring, and your face looked relaxed, and you must have had a pleasant dream because you were smiling slightly. And I just found myself staring at you for a bit. And my heart gave a funny little squeeze, and for a second, I thought something was wrong with me, but... Then it hit me that I was starting to grow awfully fond of you. I immediately suppressed those feelings. Even if I dared entertain the thought, someone like you would never, ever end up with someone like me. You have a name. You have a title, you have lands that one day will be yours. You're from a family that can trace its lineage back farther than anyone else can. I don't even have a last name. I was born to a woman who left me the steps of an orphanage with nothing but the blanket I was wrapped in. I don't know my mother, I don't know my father, I don't know where I came from. So I suppressed those feelings. I gave you one final look, turned back around and went to sleep. And that is why I was so quiet for the rest of our journey. It wasn't that you'd upset me or done anything to anger me, even though your complaining was still so fucking annoying. But I was stealing myself. Because I didn't want to entertain the idea that I could have feelings for you. And as I stayed quiet, I started to feel you pull away from me slightly. You still tried to lighten the mood with jokes and stories from your past and by asking me questions about jobs I'd been on and 
what it was like being a mercenary. But my answer stayed short. This was a business transaction. There was no place for feelings in this, even if I wanted to, which I had sorely convinced myself that I didn't. But there's another thing you learn when you're a mercenary, and that is you become a very good liar. Almost good enough to convince yourself. There was another instance where we slept in a tavern with only one bed, but this time I wouldn't even entertain your complaints or your suggestions. I laid down my cloak on the wooden floor and slept terribly that night just to avoid a situation like last time. But then when I woke up, I found that you dragged all the bedding off the bed and you laid down next to me. And that's when I was lost. That small measure of kindness was enough to break my resolve. I think it was then that I realized that my feelings were very real, even though we hadn't known each other that long. But you had done something that no one else had ever done for me. You had shown me a kindness that I felt like I didn't deserve, especially from someone like you. It's still there you lay, asleep, with a blanket half draped over me that you had stolen again in your sleep. You were drooling a little bit. And in that moment, honestly, I thought you were the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. I got mad at you when you woke up, told you that you were an idiot for doing that, which I still think you are. And you waved it away and said that I looked cold. Again, my heart gave that funny little squeeze and I... Well, I couldn't do anything else but turn away and go downstairs to get breakfast. And then, eventually, there was that night, about a day or two, travel from your destination. When your patience ran out and you got mad at me. I was trying to light the fire while we were setting up camp, and you had some firewood that you'd collected, and then eventually threw it angrily at my feet and told me what my problem was. And I first told you, this is just business, nothing personal, and then you called me a liar. <laughs> and if there's one skill aside from combat that you learn when you're a mercenary, it's lying. You learn to lie really well to other people, to yourself, to the world. You lie. So, you weren't wrong calling me a liar. You eventually kept being mad at me, begged me to tell you what you did for me to act the way I did. You pointed out rightfully that somewhere halfway through our travel, something had switched in me. I'd gone from open and entertaining your nonsense to building a wall between us, and you had had enough. And honestly, I couldn't blame you. But you kept pressing the matter. You kept begging me to tell you what was wrong, what you had done that I suddenly changed. And I told you that I couldn't tell you, that I didn't want to tell you. But then I saw those tears in your eyes and something in me broke. And that's when I hugged you. And I told you I was sorry. Which, by the way, I've never, ever admitted my fault, so feel special, I suppose. And I just kind of held you until you half shoved me away and forced me to tell you what was wrong. And that's when I admitted my feelings. I still remember the look on your face. You looked 
like a doe, <laughs> like all wide-eyed and shocked, and then you got all flustered and didn't know how to react. I still think about that quite often. And then we ended up talking, which was very mature of us. <laughs> And we talked by the fire about everything. I told you about the moment where I felt feelings start to blossom and you ended up admitting that it was kind of the same for you. But you'd reacted in the opposite way. You tried to befriend me even more, tried to tell me even more stories and crack jokes and complain less. And while you tried to get closer, I pulled away. And eventually we met in the middle. And we held hands. And eventually when it got too late in the night, we ended up going to bed. And I don't know if you did it on purpose or not, but you cuddled into me that night when you were asleep. We rolled over and you snuggled into my side and I held you and then we ended up two days later at your destination and I was pretty sure that that would be the last time I'd ever see you the goodbye was painful even though you know I held a brave face didn't shed a tear you were bawling <laughs> You promised me you'd write. And then I told you that I couldn't read, and you made the joke that you would draw pictures instead. Honestly, writing away from you after that was the most difficult thing I'd ever done in my entire life. So imagine my surprise about two weeks later when I was sitting in a tavern on my way back to Silvermore to alert your father that everything was hunky-dory when suddenly you storm in. You'd followed me. You'd given your uncle all the information he needed and then you decided, I'd, I've had enough. And you came to look for me. And you found me. Now, kids, if there is one thing you need to know, is that your mother is a menace. Yeah, you are. You followed me with no combat training whatsoever, with minimal camping skills, to try and find me to profess your love once again, so we could run away and elope. What was that? Oh, I'll be married about a year later, and then... Three years later, he adopted you. And then a year later, you. <laughs> I wish I could say it was more romantic than this, but, you know, that is how me and your mother met. Now, I think that counts as a bedtime story. It's time you two rascals go to sleep. I tit 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 no complaining. You asked for a story, I gave you one. Come on. How me and your mother got married? You want to hear about our wedding? <laughs> That's really boring. And maybe if you're good and you go to bed now, I'll tell you tomorrow. How about that? Hmm? <laughs> All right, you little menaces. Good night.